All right, good evening, everybody. Appreciate you coming out for part two uh, of this lesson or this message that I have. Um, just really appreciate the support that everybody here gives me. Um, all the feedback, um, good, bad, ugly, whatever the feedback might be, I've always appreciated because I can always get something from it. Uh, so I appreciate that. But let's go ahead and open in prayer if we could, and then we'll get into the lesson. Dear Holy Most Gracious Father, Lord, we give you thanks and praise, honor and glory, dear Lord, for everything that you are and all the blessings that you bestowed upon each and every one of us as an individual, our families, this church, this country. Lord, we just, we humble ourselves before you because you are the, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, dear Lord, and through you, we have our opportunity for salvation, dear Lord. Let us grab a hold of that, that opportunity for salvation. Let us be obedient to you. Let us walk the and run the race that you have ordered for us, dear Lord. Carry us when we are weak. Be there at, at uh, every time, dear Lord, as we walk through our trials and tribulations, because the devil will come against us. We see that so much nowadays in this country. The devil is just uh, running amok and having his way with things and enjoying his uh, time here. But uh, we also know that his time is coming. We know who actually wins in the end. So, Lord, I just pray, dear Lord, that this message tonight will be... Um, uh, strong, it'll be powerful that people will be able to take something out of this, dear Lord, to apply to their lives, or maybe the lives of their loved ones, whatever the case might be, dear Lord. And all this I ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so last week we talked about a cost benefit to just about everything there is. There's a uh, cost to go to the grocery store. The benefit is we get something to eat. Um, there's a cost to buying a particular vehicle. If you've got a particular hobby that requires a, um, a big diesel truck, maybe you need to spend the money for an F-250. If you, if you don't, uh, maybe you can get a buy with a, what is it, the Honda, or not the Honda, but the Chevy Spark or whatever it is. You know, one of them little, little cars. Nothing wrong with that. Hey, 40 miles, in a mile, 40 miles to the gallon, 50 miles, I could go for that, you know. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't pull my boat. Wouldn't pull a horse trailer. Uh, so those of us with those kind of hobbies have to spend and invest the money. But there is a cost to everything. But some things have no benefits. I mean, they're, serving the devil has no real benefit in the end. But that's about the only thing. Most things have a cost benefit. There's just no benefit, uh, truly, to serving the devil. And the greatest commandment, I'm just doing a summary, the greatest commandment is thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and with all thy soul. It didn't say part. It didn't say 99%. It didn't say whatever you get around to giving me. It says all. We talked about the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Any sin that you can commit or even think about, what? Well, gee, let me think of a sin, it's going to fall into one of those three categories. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life. Those things that fall into those categories, they're everywhere today. If you don't believe me, turn on TV. Watch a movie that's not Christian base. It'll fall into the lust of the eyes, the lust of the uh, flesh, or the pride of life. They use it in advertising. Pick up a magazine. Pick up a magazine. I don't know what it is, but you're, you put a, I don't care, whatever magazine it is, she's got a skimpy little outfit, your eye is drawn to it. Now, you, 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 yes, it's drawn to her, and then it's like, oh, the product, oh, I should buy that. Maybe it's, well, maybe my wife would like that. Whatever, you can justify it however you want. But your eyes was drawn to it first. And which in of itself is not an issue. That is not a sin. You can look at a beautiful woman, a guy can look at a beautiful man, a handsome man, whatever you want to call him. And that in itself is not a sin. We're all made in God's image, right? But it's what you do with that. Well, there's a beautiful woman. If you take that too far, that's when you get into sin. The temptation is not the sin. And they market it to everyone regardless of age. We talked about the body and how we need to take it under subjection, like Paul did. We need to discipline the lust of our body, the adultery, the fornication, the idolatry, the wrath, the strife, the envying, and so many more things. We must present our body as a living sacrifice to God. We talked about the mind, where I think most people get into trouble because, well, they're just thoughts. No, those thoughts can lead you down a path of destruction. They're not just thoughts. You have to take those thoughts captured. You have to give them over to God. You have to tell the devil to get out of your mind and renew your mind. 
We need to think on those things that are honest, what is just, what is pure, and so many more. Those are the things that we talked about last week. So this week, I'd like to talk about the heart. So if we go to Proverbs chapter 6, it says, These six, these six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that is devilish, wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Now I know what you're saying. I don't do any of those things. I don't, I'm, wicked imagination, I mean, wicked is really bad, right? You know the definition of wicked? Disposed to or marked by mischief. Well, that's a problem if you're me. Because I have a little mischievous streak in me, and even at this age, especially if I can get other people in with me. Because, you know, misery loves company, I guess. People that are unpleasant. You have unpleasant thoughts. Or maybe you're an unpleasant person. These are definitions of wicked. Because we think of wicked as really bad stuff. I mean, think of people throughout history. Uh, 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 Hitler, uh, Stalin, those were wicked people. No, we're wicked people. Because we, ha we sometimes have those kind of things. We're disposed to, mis to mischief or we're unpleasant. Causing harm or distress or trouble. Anybody ever cause any trouble in your life? Any harm? Well, we didn't intend to. We didn't mean to do it. Well, great. But that's just an excuse. You still did it. And see, that's where I was going last week with, I personally believe, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong, and if, I'm, if it doesn't apply, you don't wear the shoe. But I think that we have things that we have done that's in our lives that we don't recognize as sin, and they're unrepented for sin. But they're still sin. Whether you recognize it as sin or not doesn't mean it's not. You know, so if, even if you don't recognize it, sin is sin, and it will be judged as such. If we look at Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Can we know our own heart? Most of the times we don't know our own heart, not until we come to know Christ. God knows our heart. You know, how many times has Brother Joe preached about, you know, that God knows our heart? Maybe, maybe the, the intention was right. The heart was right. Maybe we just went about it a little different way. But our heart is right. God knows the heart. Maybe the action wasn't the best thing that we could have done. We've all, you know, looked back and go, okay, I could have said that a little bit different. You know, um, happens to me almost daily, you know. Um, well, you know, it, it, it does. Um, I, I have a tendency to, to, to be blunt. Um, I, haven't, I haven't learned to sugarcoat stuff very well. Uh, and some people don't like that. Now, I, now I'm going to justify and say, well, I'm just telling the truth. Well, there is. Now, I don't try to, I, I don't be rude. I, there's no excuse to be rude. Okay, I, I, you can be blunt and not be rude. You can be honest and not be rude. So when you tell your wife that, yeah, that outfit doesn't look, you know, I wish you'd wear that red dress instead, you don't need to be rude about going, that thing looks like a gunny sack on you. Don't be rude. Because again, we go back to, you know, there's a cost benefit of being married. You can get in trouble even if you're married. Remember that part. But God knows the heart. And I couldn't trust my heart with anything until I knew Christ. So if God searched our heart right now, what would he find? And that might be scary for some people. Expect, anybody ever did a, I forget what it's called, but it's basically a self-assessment. I'm talking a big, deep assessment. Now, you're not going to tell anybody because you'd be too embarrassed. Anybody ever do one of those? Yeah, I've done it a couple times in my life. I don't like it. You know, can you really look in the mirror every morning and go, I like that guy. Now, I can sing the song all I want, you know. Um, what is it? It's the Mac Davis song. Um, it's hard to be humble. I get perfect every day. Yeah, but it doesn't make it so. Can you look in the mirror and go, I like that person. I like what he does. I like what he stands for. My guess is there's going to be something in there. Most of us can't say, you know, 100% I like what that person is or does. There's always something that I can find and go, you know, I could be better. Because you know why I can be better? Because I haven't achieved perfection. Now, am I, going to, am I going to achieve perfection here on earth? No. But if I strive for it, I'm going to try and get as close as I can. That's, that's my goal, is to get just a little bit better in my faith, a little bit better in my walk with Christ every single day. Am I better today than I was yesterday? 
Yesterday wasn't perfect. Today's not going to be perfect. But am I better in my walk with Christ than I was yesterday? Have I learned something from yesterday? You know, that's one of the biggest things that we can do is learn from yesterday. Learn, yes, learn what we did yesterday, what we did wrong, what we could do better. There's always something we can do better. Better is not good enough is if, if we can do better. And better is not good enough until, unless it's the best. But for some people, that could be scary. Now, I'm not trying to say that, you know, well, we're just all a bunch of heathen in here, and we're all going to go to hell in a handbasket. I'm not saying there's not righteous people in here. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying, and of course, it's going to be out on YouTube here in a couple hours, that I think that there are going to be things in our life that we can improve on. You know, I mean, I just think there is. I mean, again, I, I, we can have the discussion on whether I'm, whether I'm wrong, but unless you, if you, because if you say, well, there's nothing I can improve on, then you've made perfection. Uh, so unless you're an angel sent from, from God, I'm going to have to argue that we're not perfected yet. And when you come to make Jesus the Lord of your life and have repented of your sins, he takes away those sins and you are left as if you, are ne as, as if you have never committed those sins. That's pretty cool. I mean, think about I'm not going to go into details of all the stupid stuff I, I've done. I've done a lot of stupid things, but it's like those things never happened. Don't even bring them up in my mind. You know, how many times did I, you know, come here, you know, repent of my sins? You know, if we, I used the example, I think, the other day of a rucksack. You know, you know, you got anybody in here in the military or had been in the military, 80 pound rucksack? Went for, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, 25 mile walk. Yeah, I remember them days when I could actually do that. And then when you take that 80 pound ruck off, you almost had to hold on to something because you felt like you could float away. That's how it is when you, when, you, when you get up off your knees and you leave that duffel bag full of sin, that's what it's going to feel like. It's like a burden has been lifted. I'm no longer carrying it. But what do we normally do? We get up, I mean, put that thing back on here, and we, we carry it with us. Did it for years. And it wasn't until I could even actually leave all the sins there that I felt that lightness, that I felt that peace. That's what we can have. That's what we can have if we follow Christ. He gives us a new heart, a new beginning. I just find, this, I just find that amazing. You know, because I can guarantee you, if you ask any, if, Lord help you that you find them, um, but, or I guess the Lord help me. But if you was to, to talk to anybody that I used to run around with or did stuff against, they may not have forgiven me. It took me for years. Why would they forgive me? No, we're supposed to, unless they've changed like I have. Now, I am not the same person that I was 27 years ago and before. But it's hard to forgive ourselves, but we have to because why? Because Christ will forgive them. He will forgive them. He will forget them. And I just find that so amazing that he can do that. Because there was a time I was living where I didn't need him. I mean, yeah, I've seen everybody go to church. You know, I even went to church too while I was in Germany. I mean, you know, a little bit of heavy cologne, about a mouthwash. I went to church. Not for the right reason. There's, a, there's another reason I went to church. It wasn't for the right reason. And I was miserable. I was miserable, and it didn't pay off in the end anyway. But he forgives me for all that. I can forgive myself, too, and forget about it. I've got a new beginning. We have hope. Let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. When I confess my sins... He took that heart that had been so hardened over time and removed it and gave me a new heart, a heart that was inclined towards him, not the flesh of the world. Take a look at uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are not that same person. So many people want to hold on to the past. Oh, I look back with fond memories in some of the stuff that I did. Not the bad stuff, of those at least that I remember of. Because there's a lot of stuff I don't remember, especially in Germany and Korea and, well, Port Huachuca. But, uh, but I look back on fondness of some of that stuff. I met a lot of good people. 
People I'd have never met if it wasn't for the military. I had experiences that I would never experience, good experiences that I would never experience if it wasn't for the military. Military is a great way of life recommended for anybody that's uh, graduating high school. Sign up for a couple, three, four years. I, I guarantee you, if you don't enjoy it, you will come out better than when you went in if you embrace it for what it is. But I'm not that old person. All things, the old things are passed away. So there's an old saying. Anybody ever hear this? If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. I cannot do. So many people want to get saved and then go right back to their doing the old things. And I'll get saved on Sunday, but Friday night, if I wait that long, and let's face it, probably won't, you know, maybe Monday night. Maybe I'll make it all the way to Tuesday night. Got to come to church on Wednesday because, you know, I'm a good Christian. But I want to straddle the fence. I want to keep going back and forth. You know, and I have to agree with Brother Joe on this. Pick one side or the other. Stay there because you're miserable either place. You can't fully live for Christ if you want to dabble in the sin. You can't be happy in your sin if you want to dabble in Christ. Pick one. Be good at it. Now, personally, I suggest you pick Christ. There's a lot more benefits. You'll say, well, I, I can't have any fun. Trust me, I'm having more fun today than I ever did before, and I get to remember most of it. I can't say that about 20, 30 35 years ago, I can't say that I remember every moment. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. But again, I cannot continue to do the same thing. Now, that being said, we're going to stumble and fall. We agreed with that last week. I think it still holds this week. I don't think anything's really changed on that regard. So we're still going to stumble and fall. That's all right. Don't worry about it. As soon as you, because you're covered by grace. When you recognize that you sinned, repent for it right then and there. Don't bundle them up in the evening time. Or on Friday night, I'm going to bundle them all week so I can get right before I come to church on Sunday. Don't repent for it right then and there. Well, grace has you covered. It never really says, how long does grace cover you? We had some discussion in Sunday school about that, and I actually kind of like the idea, but um, I, I don't know if that's fact, so I'm not really going to say it here. But again, we're covered by grace when we stumble and fall, but when you recognize that you stumbled and fell, go ahead and repent right then and there. It doesn't have to be a 20-minute prayer of repentance. You hear Brother Joe do the sinner's prayer. What does it take? A minute? Maybe two, and he's got to say something and then wait for us to say something. So divide it by two, and you're the only one that has to say it. So again, repent of our sins as we commit them because we are going to stumble and fall. Try to learn from it. What did I do that made me fall? Could be hanging around with an old buddy you haven't seen in 20 years. Not saying you need to cut him, cut him loose, but you know what? Let's go to the Waffle House. They have great coffee. It'll keep you up all night. And the breakfast ain't bad either. You can, have them the, you can have it smathered, slathered, and everything else every which way you want. Great breakfast. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able to uh, withstand, but will with each the, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So, temptation's not new. You're not the first person to be tempted in that particular way. I can guarantee it. I don't care what you come up with. I can find somebody else that was tempted in the same way. God will not allow us to be tempted with more than what we can withstand. And that is a hard concept because, well, God doesn't know what I'm tempted with. Sounded good in my mind. Not so much, you know, if you read your Bible a little bit. But God will not allow us to be tempted with more than what we can withstand. So what does that mean? Honestly, there is not much excuse for giving in to the temptation. Being tempted is not the sin. Don't get me wrong. If you, you can be tempted and tempted and tempted and you have not sinned, it's when you cross the line from temptation into act, act, actually doing whatever it is, there's the sin. The temptation is not the sin. I can be, I'm tempted with stuff all day long. Anybody else tempted every, every day? Oh, we got a few in here that's tempted. Great. You know, I figure it this way, and not disparaging anybody that didn't raise their hand, if, God is attack if the devil is attacking me with temptations, then evidently I'm not on his team. 
He's not going to tr work to try to keep me on his team because if I'm really liking the sin, I'm probably going to stay there. So I'm probably on God's team, in which case he has to try to get me back, therefore the temptation. And I can guarantee you, if we were honest with ourselves, and I wouldn't want anybody to say stuff out loud, but we know the temptation that the devil can give us that will be the, the hardest thing for us to, to withstand. Correct? I can guarantee it. I've got two that I know of. That I, there, There's a few more, but there's two that I struggle with daily. And daily, I ask God for the strength to get through that temptation. I pray, for, I pray to get through the temptation first thing in the morning before the devil even starts. I pray mid-morning when, when the devil starts on me. And I continue in prayer asking God for that guidance and that strength to withstand all day long until I put my head down. And then I do a final prayer, Lord, let him not invade my thoughts in my sleep. But God will not give us more than what we are able to withstand. He provides an escape. What is that escape? It's the power to say to the devil, get behind me, Satan. And in the name of Jesus Christ, he has to do it. He has to. Now, that is just simple words. It takes faith in the believing of those words. That if I say that, and I mean that, that the devil's got to flee. Now, here's what I say. If for anybody that's never been tempted, in case you ever get tempted, try it. Believe it. But try it. And once you see it, it's like, whoa, hey, that's kind of cool but it gives you strength. There's nothing like experience, whether it's, making, whether it's invoking the name of Jesus Christ to get the devil, devil to leave you alone, whether it's for healing somebody. Now, Grant, you're not doing the healing. You're just the vessel. I get that. But those experiences then strengthen your faith. Because if I was stu stood it today, I can withstand that same temptation tomorrow. Right? I mean, I've set the precedence. Am I weaker today than I was yesterday? Hopefully not. There's days I am. But experience is a great teacher. It gives you the confidence that says, I've got the power to make the devil run in any form that that devil takes. If we take a look at James. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. I always struggle with that. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Good gads. But you are. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now again, you're enduring the temptation. You're not giving in to the temptation. You're enduring it. But when you are tried, you will be found acceptable in the sight of Christ. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth any man. You are not tempted by God. How many, how many times have we heard that in our lives? Well, God's just tempting me. No, God's not going to tempt you. Let's place the blame where it belongs, which we'll get into hell here in a little bit. But put the, we don't like to invoke the, the idea that there's a devil that's out there making me do bad stuff. You're right. He ain't making you do bad stuff. The devil will not make you do anything but he'll tempt the heck out of you. He'll tempt you to where you can't hardly withstand it, and you say, oh, man, i got to have it. Oh, got to have Lord, In the name of Jesus Christ, get behind me. You have no place in my life today. It will work. But every man is tempted. So if you think you're not going to be tempted, read it right there again. It's up on the screen. Maybe. You're on the New King James. That's what screwed me up. I'm like, it doesn't match what I have. Wouldn't be the first time. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. See, the temptation is not the sin. It's giving in to it. And sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. If you want to live in a life of sin, and hey, if that's the lifestyle you want, who am I to say you shouldn't? You know, knock yourself out, be good at it, enjoy yourself, but you will die. I don't mean physically, we're all going to physically die. And actually, I want to take that back a little bit. You're going to die? Well, we'll get that into hell here in a second.
I don't want to, I don't want to spoil that. There is a high cost of following Jesus. Everybody agree? There's a higher cost if we don't. I mean, if the, when I look back on all those things that I did, if I would have died right then and there, I'd have split hell wide open, guaranteed. I mean, there have been a, I, I probably had a cheering section down there. So if we talk about hell for a few minutes, we don't hear that preached about much anymore. When I was a kid, they preached hell was so hot you could feel the heat. You could get a sunburn from it. That's why I don't sit on that front row anymore. I don't like that front row. Uh-uh. It's Because uh, you had a hellfire and brimstone message every Sunday. And the kids started off in here, not back there. We started off in here, in my church that I grew up in. And it was a hellfire and brimstone. You felt the fire of, the, of hell. I mean, the old saying, they tried to scare the hell out of you? Yeah. That's what they were trying to do. But they made it real. See, we don't do that anymore. In today's society and in today's church, we've turned down the heat. I mean, it's uncomfortable. But I mean, so is Texas in August sometimes. Well, August is normally... Hey, anybody been not, not uncomfortable the last couple, three, four, ten months? You know? I mean, it's, it's hot. Not enough, not hot enough to make me move back up north where they have the the other version of hell up there with the snow for six months out of the year. Can't, I can't fathom that. Not anymore. But we make it to where it's not unbearable. I mean, well, I mean, granted, heaven is going to be nice. But hell's not going to be that bad, right? Well, let's go on a little farther and see where, where we can go with this. But that's where we are in a society today. We don't like to talk about, it's kind of like, we don't want to talk about the devil because, oh, he's scary. You know, well, I mean, yeah, it, well, I can't recognize the devil. Well, if he came in a, a, a fort horns and a pitchfork, of course, everybody would be able to see him. Well, we, we normally don't recognize the devil. So we don't like, you know, that the neighbor across the street, maybe he's the devil. You never know. You know, the same, well, hell's not that bad. Yes, it is. So what is hell like in the Bible? And I thought this was interesting. In the Gospels, Jesus spoke of hell more than he did of heaven. In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, hell is mentioned seven times. Hades is mentioned two times, along with eight descriptive terms concerning fire. And out of the Gospels, Jesus, uh, Mo, uh, Matthew speaks of hell the most. And out of the entirety of the New Testament writings, Matthew contains the most content on hell, with revelations coming in second. So it must be important. We should pay attention to it. So let's take a look at Matthew real quick. It teaches us that those that do not bear good fruit will be cast into fire. And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. We're that tree. We're going to be hewn down if we are not putting forth good fruit. And we're going to be cast into the lake of fire. Scholar William Hendrickson writes, the fire into which the unfaithful trees are cast is a symbol of the final outpouring of God's wrath upon the wicked. The fire is unquenchable. Don't call the fire department. They don't have anything that can put the fire out. If, I don't care how many fire extinguishers you have. I don't care what technology they have at the airports now that can smother, you know, and suck all the oxygen out, you know, to, to put the fire out. It's unquenchable. The point is not merely that there's always a fire burning in hell, but that the wicked will burn with unquenchable fire and the fire that has been prepared for them as well for the devil and his angels. So when I talked about earlier about how you know, we'll all die physically, and they talk about how you'll, your sins will lead to death, and I, and yes, I agree with that because that's what the Bible says, but you're going to feel the fire. It's not like we're just sitting around going, oh, I've got some flames coming out, that's kind of cool, but you're not feeling it. You will feel it. Your flesh will burn for eternity if you're in hell. Now, some of us have been to the desert, a little on the hot side. Ain't got nothing on it. Nothing on it. Hell is a place you don't want to go. Hell is a place of torment. We always heard of, as, as kids, my grandmother loved this, you know, the gnashing of teeth and the wailing. It's like gnashing of teeth. You know, you had the idea of, I don't know, a werewolf or something, I guess, coming after you. Not, not a good picture when you're five years old. 
Uh, but again, um, it was her way of explaining hell. Hell is a place of torment ordained by God for devils and reprobate sinners, wherein by his justice he confines them to everlasting punishment, tormenting them both in body and soul, being deprived of God's favor. So we know how much, how much joy we get being in God's favor. We all have hope because we have God in our lives, right? Now take away all hope. Take away all hope and you're left with fire and that's it. And torment. You're deprived of God's favor, objects of his wrath, under which they must lie to all eternity. You might ask, how is that justice? But God gave us the opportunity to avoid it. God didn't send us to hell. We did that on our own. Now, he judged us. But he judged us by our actions. He gave us the ticket out. It's not, it's not that hard to punch a ticket to heaven. I mean, it's really not. Especially when you look at what the alternative is. I mean, okay, you can't do some of the things you used to do. I don't want to do those things anyway. I mean, I don't, I don't hang around with anybody that drinks. I just don't. I mean, okay, I don't hang around with a lot of people anyway. But still, I don't like being around people that drink. We love, me and Mary jo, we love to go dance. We haven't, well, except when they have it here at the church, we haven't been in years. Why? I'm too old for the drunk GI crowd and all that that entails. I don't want to come out thinking that I was just in a furnace because of all the smoke and I want to strip down in the parking lot, throw my tr clothes in the trash and drive home that way. So if I could find a place that opens about 7 in the evening where I could still dance until maybe 9, 9.30, be in bed by 10.30, I'd be good to go. I just don't like that crowd, so we don't go that often. you know. But that's a choice that we made. We all have to make our choices in life. But God gives us the opportunity to choose where we want to go. Choose Him, choose life, choose heaven. Hell is a belief and teaching that many would like to avoid and forget altogether. Let's forget about hell. You know, I mean, I, I worked with a guy in Austin. We know there's not a hell, or we know there's not heaven, we just hope there's not a hell. But you've got to have yin and yang. And if you think, if you think there might be a hell, then you better hope there's a heaven. Let's find an alternative. I mean, I'd rather die and go, oh, this is it, and there not be heaven or hell, than to wind up in hell and go, gee, I guess heaven was real. No, that's not why I serve God. That's not why I serve God. But again, you've got a choice of where you want to go. It is a harsh and terrifying truth that awaits those who will not respond to the gospel. Theologian R.C. Sproul writes, There is no biblical concept more grim or terror-invoking than the idea of hell. It is so unpopular with us that few would give credence to it at all, except that it comes to us from the teaching of Christ himself. If Jesus didn't talk about it, we'd probably skip right over it. Because let's face it, we want to know what Jesus said, don't we? We do. We want to know what Jesus said. I mean, he is the authority, but he talked about hell. He also talked about, he talked about other things, but he also talked about hell. New Testament teaching about hell is meant to appall us and strike us dumb with horror, assuring us that as heaven will be better than we could dream, so hell will be worse than we can conceive. Now, we have these pictures of, uh, what is it, uh, streets of gold, gates of pearl. I'm not even sure that's going to, because I think it, it, at that time, and I think today even, gold is one of the most precious things we can think of. I mean, you know, it's just back then it was very, very valuable. It's still is valuable today. But it's going to be even more beautiful. Let me put it this way. My, my idea of the most beautiful thing that I can conceive is a bass lake that only I have access to, so I don't have to worry about anybody else being out there. And I won't say I'm catching six and seven pounders on every cast, but probably every other cast. I mean, I can throw a bare hook in there. I'm going, that is almost like my idea of, of, of paradise, right? And it's going to be so much better than I'm not saying I'm going, to be, I'm going to have a lake in heaven. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is our imagination cannot conceive of what heaven is really going to be like. It's going to be so much more than we could ever conceive. Find the most beautiful house in the world. It's going to be better than that. Your mansion will be better than that in heaven. Now, go the other direction. We've talked about the fire of hell and the tormenting of hell, the gnashing of teeth and the wailing of pain. That sounds pretty bad. It's going to be worse than that. We can't conceive how bad it is. I mean, even if somebody has been burned in their life, and I'm talking a, a severe burn, and I understand those things are very, very painful, especially when they go to scrape away um, uh, all the dead skin. Think of the rest of your life like that. 
constantly all over, burning with fire. You can't get, it's like an itch you can't itch out, an itch you can't get rid of, you can't reach. You can't get rid of the fire burning your flesh. I don't know about y'all, but that's a scary thought. That should be a sobering thought. But how many of us put weight to that? I mean, okay, I, I mean, I don't want to go to hell. Don't get me wrong, you know. But we don't, we don't think about how bad it's going to be. And maybe the point could be made that, you know what? I'm living right for Christ. I'm going to heaven. I don't have to worry about hell. But I think we need to know about hell so we can talk to those people that don't know Christ and go, you know, because they're going to go, well, I understand hell's pretty bad. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, kind of like Camp Case of Korea, right? No, no, no. I mean, that was Sodom and Gomorrah. Don't get me wrong. But it ain't hell. Well, it's, it's as bad as, uh, you know, the, the, the slums in L.A., right? No, no, going to be worse than that. But we've got, so we've got to know and be able to talk about what hell is really going to be like so we can talk to people because they've got a choice. We can talk to them about God all day long, and that's great. But here's your alternative, sir. Here's hell. And give them both sides. Most people, if they have any brain cells left, should say, yeah, that's pretty bad. I don't want that. How do I get God? That's what we want. But I think we have to be prepared for both sides of that discussion. It's going to be worse than we could ever conceive. And I can conceive of a lot of bad stuff and bad places. That is the cost of, fo of not following Jesus. And I don't think anybody in here, and you can correct me if I'm wrong if you're willing to raise your hand, I don't think anybody wants to disagree. We don't want to follow. We don't want to pay that price of not following. But are we willing to pay the price to serve Jesus? Are the benefits worth it? Because let's face it, we've been talking about cost benefits. There's a cost to following Jesus, but there are benefits behind that. Fair enough? Let's talk about life everlasting in heaven. I mean, I, that's probably one of the greatest benefits, the ultimate benefit. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Everlasting life in heaven with God and Jesus. And I have to figure that I, I am part of that whosoever. And most times when I read that, that if I believe in him, I, shouldn't, I will not perish. I make it personal when I read that verse most times. I make a lot of the verses when it talks about, you know, they or them or whatever, me, I, make it personal. I can have salvation. Not everybody. I mean, okay, it's open to everybody, but it's me. He died on the cross for everybody, right? No, he died for me. That's how, because if, if everybody has that, then I'm not that special, right? So I make it personal. I have the salvation. He died for my sins. I'm special to him. I mean, let's face it. I'm not, no offense, but I'm not going to the cross for y'all. I mean, I'm not going to the phys physical cross and be killed thinking I'm going to be able to redeem your sins. I'm not sure I like everybody quite that much. Uh, now, God can tell, I don't think God's going to tell me, well, yeah, you do, and we're going to prove it. But anyway, if he does, then so be it. But he loved me enough that he, that he took it, his sins, my sins, the sins that I should be paying for. And that's another sobering, I had a lot of sobering thoughts during this, this study. You know, the, 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 the sins that I committed, he took on his own body and died for those. And these were sins, I mean, he I mean, he knew me, but we're talking 2,000 years ago before I ever came upon earth, and he knew us. You know, I just find that powerful. Let's look at John real quick. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be of him a well of water up springing up into everlasting life. The theme of everlasting life in heaven. What a benefit of following Christ. The presence of God. Let's look at Psalms. These gates lead to the presence of the Lord and the godly enter there. So it's talking about how I can go into the presence of God Almighty. Because when Jesus died on the sin, ripped the veil, we can now go into the Holy of Holies. I can take my, my prayers and my needs and my wants and my desires straight to God himself. What a deal. I don't have to have an intermediary anymore. I mean, if we were still back where I had to sacrifice animals, I could have owned the 4-6's ranch, and I'd be down to one cow. 
Maybe. But I don't have to sacrifice anything like that again because of what Christ did for me. All I have to do is repent of my sins, make Him Lord of my life, and I'm, and I'm saved. What a deal. I can go in the presence of God Himself. Proverbs. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. If we seek Him, we will find Him. And then it says, in the one that we just did, into the presence of the Lord. We will find Him if we seek Him. Seek Him daily. Several times a day. As much time as you can every day. Not saying that you shouldn't have a hobby. Not saying everybody put in your resignation tomorrow. Craig, you're not going to work, sorry. You know, because you got to spend all day. Not saying that. I didn't think there was anybody who's probably going to do that. We've got enough sense. But at the same time, keep that attitude of Christ at all times upon you. Because if we seek Him, we will find Him. Peace in our lives. I think probably peace is one of the things that most people don't have and truly want to have. It is hard to have true peace. And peace can only, true peace can only come from one place. If we look at John 14. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. If a, an untroubled heart and not being afraid of anything, to me, that's got to be ultimate peace. I mean, what do I have to fear from man if I'm living for Christ? Oh, man can hurt you physically, don't get me wrong. I mean, they take a tire iron up against your head, you're going to feel it. But ultimately, who got hurt the worst? Me with the bashed in head or the person that did the bashing? If he kills me, I'm in paradise today. What a deal, you know? I mean, not that I'm, I'm ready to go today. I may not want to go today, but I'm ready to go today. Because we don't know when our day is up. And then back to Psalms. The Lord will give you strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. If there was ever anything this country needs right now, is peace. We can have discussion. We can have arguments for all, for all I care. But if you don't agree with me, then you're a terrorist, and you're this, or you're that, or whatever. You're the enemy. Is a bunch of baloney. What happened to having a conversation? But we've gotten so far away from that in this country, I think, because we're at war with everything. You know? I mean, Wayne, I just don't like blue shirts. I just think you're wrong for wearing a blue shirt tonight. I mean, I'm not even going to talk to him ever again. I'm, you sit on this side, I'm going to sit as far as I can over here because I just don't like the shirt he's wearing. That's about where we're at in this country. Makes no sense, does it? Does it, why it, makes, it doesn't make sense why we can't come together and figure out what's the best for this country, what is truly best. Because I think everybody thinks they're doing the best. Um, but they don't really understand what is best. But we need to have peace in our lives. Power of the Most High God. If we look at Acts. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and into the other parts of the earth. And since I don't live in Jerusalem or Judea and Samaria, and he has never called me to visit those places, I assume I live in the uttermost parts of the earth. I can spread his gospel here. There's a lot of people in our community that need to know Christ. Shoot, there's people in my family that needs to know Christ. But we have that power. We have the power of the Spirit upon us. And all we have to do is have faith. And then in Luke. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have the power if we will believe in it. What did it say? If you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can do what? You can tell this mountain to move from here and there? Now, I always thought that was a physical mountain. I thought that would be pretty cool, but they're talking about the problems in your life. You have the power to get rid of those. You have, you got out, you're an alcoholic, an, an alcoholic, you have the power to get rid of that. Through Jesus Christ, you can get rid of that. Because let's face it, you can come to know Christ 
You're still an alcoholic. You're still an alcoholic. And you're going to battle that. But you have the power to get rid of it. Addicted to drugs the same way. Hey, alcohol gave that up fairly easy. Copenhagen was a whole, and I never did, I never did drugs, but Copenhagen was the hardest thing I ever gave up. Hardest thing, hardest thing. Tried to give it up three different times. That last time, or well, time before, I was on day, like day number three. And we had to fix the, the, um, the, the, the trap underneath the sink. And those threads just were not lining up. They weren't li lining up. I was getting frustrated. I told Mary Jo, I said, I'll be right back. Ran down to HEB, got me a can of Copenhagen, put it in there, came back, got underneath there. It's another three years before I tried again. Uh, to quit Copenhagen, not do, the, not do the plumbing. It was hard. I had to give up. I mean, it took a lot to give that up, and I didn't give it up to cold turkey. I got weaned off of that with some stuff I got on the Internet, which is basically nothing. I could have went out and got a bunch of hay and grass in the field, chopped it up, and been about the same stuff. But it helped. I'm serious. It's called quit chew. Take a big old bucket, six cans of that stuff, one can of Copenhagen. Or no, I'm sorry, one can of that, six cans of Copenhagen. That's what you, that's what you dip all week. And then each week it's one less Copenhagen, one more quit chew. And at the, at the end of, uh, what, a few weeks, all you have is this quit chew, and it's like, oh, this is just right. This is, this is really bad. But it worked. It worked. Because I wasn't, I don't, and that's why, there's no dipping on my boat. No dipping. Yes, I don't want, I don't want stuff on my carpet. But if I smell Copenhagen, I will, my mouth will water. It will to this day, and I haven't dipped in probably near at least 18 years, 19 maybe, 20. But my mouth will still water. Alcohol, I give a dang about it. Don't even care for the smell of it, truthfully. But we have to have, we have to discipline our bodies to be able to do that, and God gives us the power to do that. I don't care, you know, I don't care what, maybe it's not a, maybe it's not a bad habit, it's just something you want to give up. You still have the power to do it. You know, everything that, things that we need to give up in our lives is not necessarily a sin. It's just not. Maybe there's stuff in our life we want, I mean, you know, I, I want to lose a few weights, a few, a few uh, pounds in weight. Okay? God gave us the power to do that. We have to believe it and exercise that, and I mean the, the power, not exercise our body, we need to do that also, you know. But most of the problem is we don't exercise the power to, to lose our weight. Now, I'm not saying, Lord, let me lose weight. Hey, what a deal. I'm down 50 pounds. What a deal. I'm not, yeah, I wish. I'm not saying that. But we have the power to discipline our bodies. We do. God gave, did not Jesus say that he did all these things and greater will we do? Now, he raised the dead. You know, I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure I got the faith to go to a funeral home just praying, hoping one day this guy's going to pop up. I, I know Brother Joe talks about that one guy up in Dallas. He's just waiting for that to happen. We got that power if we truly believe it. The problem is, yeah, I don't think I got that power. I mean, honestly, guy's going to pop up. That'd be a trick, wouldn't it? That would get people's attention. Sometimes God's going to get our attention one way or the other. I often remember about what George Jones had said after his bad car wreck, you know, because he, you know, I mean, of course, he had been in alcohol and drugs for years. He got away from it, got sobered up, got clean, and then he went back to the alcohol. And he said, you know, after he recovered and everything, he said, you know, I prayed to God to get my attention any way you had to. That wreck almost killed his life. Two miles from home, he had a wreck. Last rated liver, I mean, he was in the hospital for months. So be careful when you say, Lord, get my attention. You never know what size of hammer he's going to use upside your head. but he will get our attention one way or another. We battle against the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life every single day once we make Jesus Lord of our life. The idea that, you know, I've made Jesus the Lord of my life, everything is going to be roses without the thorns, it's going to be hunky-dory, I'm on, I'm on easy street, is a farce. It's not the case. Life just got a little harder. And when I say harder, I just mean that those old things are going to come back and go whisper in your ear, you know, you're not going to make it through Monday morning at work. I got saved on Sunday morning. You're not going to make it. And as soon as you slip, I mean, clock in at 8 o'clock and at 8.05, you slip with, at work because somebody just, you know that one person at work, you just, yeah, we all know. Maybe you're that person. No. And, you, and the devil's going to whisper in your ear, told you you couldn't do it. And you've got to have the faith. And it's hard when you're a brand new Christian. It's not easy when you've been walking in your walk for a while. 
But it's really hard as a new Christian to say, devil, <laughs> no, 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 no. I believe that God is Lord of my life. He forgave me of my sins yesterday. He's still Lord of my life today. Get behind me. It takes faith to do that. But the devil's going to whisper in your ear, you couldn't do it. You're an alcoholic. What does most alcoholics do? They, at some point, a lot of times, they'll go and have another drink. They only expect to have one, but they have more than one. You're covered by grace. Repent, get back up on the horse. You know? But you've got to be actively defending yourself against the attacks of the devil, and we do that through prayer. We do that through prayer. Because physically, we can't do anything. We can't do anything physically against a spiritual being, and we don't have the spiritual aspects of it. Only God can do that. But we have that, that defender of our lives, and that is Jesus Christ. But we have to defend against it. Again, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that's all there is that's going to catch us. We have to, we have to be extremely careful about that and guard against that. So what I find to be so important in my own personal life, my own personal struggles... Prayer, above all things. I try to do it first thing in the morning. Reading my Bible. Studying it. Don't just read it. Study it. Don't know where to start? Come and see me. Go, go see Brother Joe. We all know those people in the church that are good, solid Christians. Go ask them, where should I start? My personal recommendations, um, Romans. I personally, well, actually, I'd go back and say, I'd say James. Because if you can live out James, you're good to go. I think. Romans, Hebrews, Acts. But don't forget the New Testament. I just wouldn't start there. Because that could get very old very quickly depending on where you start. Like, you know, the Levitical law. Yeah. But I've forgiven her. I've forgiven her. Because I had, wasn't too forgiving when we were going through it for, uh, you know, what, 18 months? All I can say is I'm glad we don't live under the law. Good grief. Ten Commandments is hard enough to live by, let alone the 600-some-odd things they had. And then associating and interacting with fellow Christians. I, who you surround yourself with will help you stay on your track of, of leading a godly life. Now, don't, that doesn't mean kick to the curb all your old friends, but be guarded when you say, hey, let's hang out. Let's get together for a barbecue, because what does most people want at a barbecue? Alcohol of some kind. I don't know, because I, I barbecue, but I, I, don't, I don't drink, so I don't know what they bring, because we don't invite people over. But that drink, that drink, that drink, just because I haven't invited you. But, but interacting with people, there's Sunday school. There's two adult Sunday schools down in the, uh, on Sunday mornings at the other end of the church. They're both doing the same uh, study, but I can guarantee it's going to be a little bit different because of teaching styles the discussion between the people that are in the class. But there's Sunday school. You can learn a lot in that class. You will grow in that class. Of course, pre preaching to the choir, because there's Wednesday nights, there's Sunday mornings, you know. Um, I personally think that everybody should feel comfortable ca calling on somebody else in this church. If I'm struggling, I know I've got, a, I don't know, half a dozen people off the top of my head, men and women, that I can go to and say, I need prayers. I don't need to tell them what I need prayers for. They just need to know I need prayers. And they'll pray with me right then. Go to them. Call them up. Send them a text message. You don't have to go into the whole long life story of what's going on. You can if you want. But they don't need to really know it. Now, that being said, I like to pray specifically. So, you know, you're having health issues? Say, can, I'm having health issues. Can you pray for me? Hey, God knows what the health issue is. But at least I can say, Lord, he needs healing of the health issues he has, whatever it is. Because God already knows it. But I find it so powerful to be around other Christians and others of like mind. I find it powerful. I also find it easier on my walk with Christ. Because, I mean, while we don't have a lot of people over the house, it's just, that's just us. I mean, Mary Jo didn't have her stamping and sewing ladies at the house. We'd never have visitors. Um, but not all of them are godly women. But it gives her an opportunity to witness to them. You know, there's also no alcohol, there's no smoking, nothing's out. I don't think there's everything been ever said. They just know not to bring that kind of stuff. Instead, they bring pecan pie and I go out and talk with them for a while. <laughs> they, a couple of them are really good bakers. So I also know that when I'm getting beaten down, 
to go to those men and women of the church, and we all know who they are, and ask them to pray for us. So last week I mentioned how I believe that many of us have that unrepented sin, and I still believe that. We just don't recognize it, and that's why every day I ask God, if I've got unrepented sin in my life, in my soul, convict me of it so I can repent of it and be truly clean, cleansed of my sins. Because I think we all have those things. We just don't recognize it. Um, a couple of my weaknesses, sarcasm. I am a sarcasm kind of a person. Not right. Not right. Yeah. 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 No. Um, jokes. I, I like a good joke. I'm not talking dirty or unclean. I'm not talking about them. I'm just talking about jokes that could bring somebody down. Or what about those, those busts? Somebody just says something that's like, before I think, I have it. if I had to think about it, I wouldn't be funny. What I think is funny. You know, we had an incident in, uh, not an incident, but something was brought up in Sunday school, okay? And this person wants to run a marathon. And I said, <laughs> I think you're crazy. Now, that, that was just wrong. Was that, was that uplifting? No, it was not. No, it was not. I mean, I don't understand why anybody would punish their body that way. Some people don't understand how you can stand on the front end of the boat for eight or nine hours a day. Easy for me. I want to do it. But she found, she found God in those, those long runs. And, and I'll admit, when I had to run long distance, not, not marathons, you'd find something in that to dig down deep and get you that strength. I do the same thing on the boat. I can find God on that boat every single time I'm on the water. But I did not speak life into her. And I apologized to her afterwards because I was convicted that that was, you know, that was, but it was just a bust, right? But it did not speak life into somebody. She should be commended for wanting to do that because that's what she believes. That's what, and I believe the same way because God said, this is what I want you to do. She can use that. Hey, I'm never going to reach somebody in a marathon. I'm not doing it. But if she can, what a deal. That's why there's so many different people in here. You know, we've got fishermen, we've got um, um, barrel racers, we've got people that golf, several people that golf. We've got quilters in here, you know. We've got people that like motorcycles, you know. Um, I like four wheels. I like four wheels. But again, hey, that's your thing. Great, be good at it because you can use that for Christ. He can use that. Because let's face it, I'm not going up to some burly-looking biker dude covered with tattoos, chain hanging out, what, and leathers and everything else, and go, hey, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. You could. But Craig's more likely to run in. Yeah, well, you used to patrol, you ride motorcycles. Don't be surprised when they come telling you about Jesus. That's true, too. That's true, too. But he's more likely to run into them, because let's face it, I just don't hang out with those, where those people would hang out. Not that I have, I, I've got nothing against motorcycles. I didn't, I wasn't raised on them, raised with them, never had one, but I got nothing against people that want them. Some people can't understand why you want a boat. Each of their own. But again, just it's those kind of things that I'm talking about, though, that we have to be careful of that we have in our lives. We think it's funny. Let's face it, and everybody laughs. Doesn't make it right. And that's the kind of things I'm talking about. And you say, well, you know, those are little sins. Well, okay. Um, well, we, we kind of do the bar chart. You know, murder somebody is up here. That little white lie is down here. That's how we judge it. God sees sin. He sees the top of it. That's it. That's a line. So those are the kind of things that I'm talking about that we think, well, they don't mount to anything. Well, they do to God. I would hate to get up there. And he goes, well, remember that, uh, that sarcastic joke you made, you know, 27 years ago? Not really. And then he replays it on, you know, because he's got everything recorded up there. And I, yeah, well, you know, that's a sin. And you never repented for it. I would hate to get caught in that situation, you know. So again, those are the kind of things I'm thinking that we have, have in our lives. Because most of us, I think, in here are probably good, solid Christians that have, have repented for all the real stupid stuff we've done in life. It's the little things we don't recognize because we find them funny. It's a joke. Well, sarcasm never hurt anybody, but it could. It could. And that's what we have to be careful of. But again, there is a cost to following Jesus but the benefits far outweigh it. And you can get past the, well, you know, I don't want to go to hell, you know. Well, I, but do you really understand? I don't know how Brother Joe feels. I got three more women telling me what to do. Do 
we don't, we have to understand what hell is going to be like so we can honestly tell people that we are witnessing to. Now, we don't want to scare them and say, well, if you don't get it right, you're going straight to hell. I mean, that's the God's honest truth, though. We, but again, there's a way to say it and give them the opportunity to see both sides. Because otherwise, it's just like, well, you're just bashing me with one side of everything. You're not even talking about this over here. Talk about that. The Lord will convict them and go, yeah, gnashing of teeth, wailing in pain, uh, the whole lake of fire, everlasting uh, torment, and your flesh burning forever. Well, there, and then there's, there is that. There's separation from God forever. You know, should be enough to sober everybody up and get them. But as the Bible says, not everybody will find that narrow gate. But any questions? Any comments? Concerns? Thank you. All right, if you could turn that off, please.